ولك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا ما رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضاء ولك الحمد أبدا 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 الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعيله ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم واضرب لهم مثل الرجلين جعلنا لأحدهما جنتين من أعناب وحففناهما بنخل وجعلنا بينهما زرعا كلتا الجنتين آتت أكلها ولم تظلم منه شيئا وفجرنا خلالهما نهرا رب الشح لصدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين I was very conflicted about what to share in this khutbah with you today but I decided that I would focus my attention on one particular passage from Surah Al-Kahf and I'd like to start by expressing my appreciation and my uh, just pleasant surprise at meeting this community for the first time. I've been traveling across the country for some time now, alhamdulillah, but this is the first time I've been to Wisconsin and obviously the city also. May Allah Azza wa Jalla bless this community and the efforts that are being made in this community. So, what I wanted to share with you is some reminder for myself and for all of you from Surah Al-Kahf, the surah we're supposed to recite every Friday. And before I start talking a little bit about these ayat, I want to share with you an observation that I've been sort of on the side been making about our community and communities across the world in general, a sociological fact that there are lots and lots of families in the world, it doesn't even matter if they're Muslim or not, but they push their children to be successful. This idea of wanting your children to be successful is very common. It doesn't matter if you're a Hindu family or a Buddhist family or you know, your Western European family or an American family or you know, Arab family, it doesn't matter. We want our children to be successful. And we define that success in very specific or very similar ways. So for instance, in Chinese culture, you're considered successful at the point where your children are, you know, they've obtained a high degree in education, they've obtained a career, they own a property, they own some patch of real estate, you know, and they've made it, they've paid those things off and now they're considered successful. And they work and they work and they work towards those things. And actually in, in some aspects of that culture, families compete with each other and the parents, they get together and they, ta they share notes on their kids. Well, my, my kid already finished law school. And my kid is in the middle of med school, but he'll finish soon. And he's already bought this and he's already bought that. They actually, they compare with each other. And when they find out one of the sons in the community has go gone further, they all humiliate their own children saying, why can't you be more like him? But you know, what, what, one thing I realized, that's not just Chinese culture. <laughs> that's Muslim culture too now. Across the, across the border and across ethnicities and cultures, we push our children to be successful. We look at other families and their kids and what they've attained and what schools they went to and what degrees they got and where they bought a house and how lavish their wedding was. And we want ours to be the same way. We're in this competition all the time. We're almost in this competition. And actually, the more you don't really look at your child or your success even as, your, as a person yourself, 
You don't even all the time look at your own success looking at what's good for you or not. You're always comparing yourself to somebody else. You're constantly comparing, well they did this, and they, somebody else did that. And that was put into many of us by our, our parents themselves who used to put us and our siblings in competition. They used to tell you when you were little, why can't you be more like your brother? He did all of these things and how, can, how come you can't do that? So if one of you, you know, if you have a brother who went to med school, well, your qadr has been written, right? So, because if you went to med school, your parents are going to say, well, your brother did it, what's wrong with you? Why can't you go? You know, it doesn't matter what you were created for, now you've been created for med school. One of my friends told me, one of the scholars I respect a lot told me, you know, the great minds of Western society, people like, you know, even in film, for example, Steven Spielberg, if Steven Spielberg was a Muslim, he'd probably be a doctor, he wouldn't be a producer. <laughs> right? Because we have certain definitions of success when we push our generations in that direction. I wanted to share this passage with you because in this passage Allah talks about two Muslims, two Muslims that are neighbors to each other. One of them is pretty wealthy. And the indication that he's so wealthy is that Allah makes it a point to mention his assets. Now think about that. Allah dedicated ayat of the Qur'an to describe the assets, the, the things that this guy owns. That's a pretty big deal that Allah would do that. But I told you there's two people, right? So if you describe the assets of one, then you should expect that the assets, the ownership, the property of the other should be described also. But what you very interestingly find is Allah dedicates two ayat describing this person's assets, the first farmer, gardener, his assets, but the other guy is so negligible in what he owns, Allah doesn't even mention it. What he owns isn't even brought up. So he's, it goes without saying, he's not doing that well financially. He's, tough, times have hit him tough. And this conversation happens between this very wealthy, I'm telling you again, Muslim, and another Muslim. These two Muslims are having a conversation. And this conversation is recorded. So let's, let's take a peek inside this, this dialogue that happens and how I wanted to share with you this is a living conversation. This is not just a conversation that happened many thousands of years ago and Allah Azza wa gave us a glimpse of it. This conversation hap happens every day between people like you and me. So Allah Azza wa says, وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلَ الرَّجُلَيْنِ Give them the example of, strike the example for them of the two men. جَعَلْنَا لِأَحَدِهِمَا جَنَّتَيْنِ مِنْ عَنَابِ for one of those two men, we gave him two gardens. So one of this guy doesn't even have one property, he has two properties of grapevines. Min you know, a'nab. I used to live in Long Island at some part of my life in New York. And some of the most expensive real estate on Long Island is the vineyards, all the way out east. By, you know, by the water almost. And these are some of the most expensive real estate even in the country. Vineyards are not cheap, they're expensive to maintain, they're not like any other crop, you have to take a lot of care of them. They're very delicate plants, they can't even stand on their own. You have to put sticks in the ground and they wrap themselves around the sticks, the trellises, they wrap themselves around. So they're not, they, they don't manage themselves. You know how some plants, they grow on their own and they can stand on their own and you don't have to take care of them? These are very delicate plants, they require constant care. And if they require constant care, you need a lot of employees, don't you? You can't just go around in, in a massive giant farm taking care of every single plant yourself. You have to hire people to do that. So the guy that owns two farms, it kind of goes without saying that he probably had a lot of employees. He had manpower behind him and Allah Azza wa Jal described it as such. So he says, جَنَّتَيْنِ مِنْ أَعْنَابِ وَنَخِي And Allah Azza wa Jal says, so, so he has gardens of grapevines and of palm. And he goes further to say, وَحَفَفْنَهُمَا بِنَحْ well, it's not nakhid, but wa He fortified his gardens with palm trees. Now this, this is very interesting. I want you to imagine this picture. There's grapevines, these really delicate plants in the middle, a huge field of them. And all around there are palm trees, like the fence. It's not a wooden fence, it's a fence of trees. And that's important because if the wind blows, these plants can get damaged. So his idea of protecting these plants is to put these gigantic palm trees all around and that's his security system. So when the wind hits, it hits the trees first. It doesn't hit the plants first. So not only does he have a very good investment, he's got a very good security system too. And obviously the palm trees themselves are producers of wealth for him. So he's got money on top of money on top of money. But you know, additionally what do you need? You need other kinds of crop too. Actually before I go there, Allah says, And between the two of them, there were also additional farmland. So this is just two of the things he has that Allah highlights, the more exotic assets, he has even more. 
كلتا الجنتين آتت أكلها You know, those of you, I mean, many of us are not in farming, but those of you that come from backgrounds that you know about farm, farmland and farming, it's a very stressful work. You have to work the entire year, and it's, you know, now many of you have jobs, now you get a paycheck every week. Or you get a paycheck every two weeks. In farming, you get one paycheck a year. You have to work the entire year, and at the end of it, when the crop comes out, that's when you get paid. And even that paycheck is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed because it could be there's a drought or there are insects that came into your farm, something went wrong, there was overheating, right? There was a flood, all kinds of problems can happen and your entire years of work is gone. In this blink of an eye, it's gone. And you can't recover it. That's the life of a farmer. It's very, very stressful. It's very difficult. But Allah Azza wa Jal describes his farm as atat ukulaha. It used to give both of these gardens, they used to produce their food. In other words, they were doing, they were at 100% production. Year after year after year, things were going well, no weather problems, no insect problems, everything was taken care of. So, you know, and if, in farming, if things go well, you make a lot of money. You know, you make a lot of money. So he was doing very, very, very well. And so Allah is still describing the first neighbor. He hasn't even talked about the second neighbor yet, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, وَلَمْ تَظْلِمْ مِنْهُ شَيْئًا You know how you say, ah, our farm produced 80%, 50%, 70%. لَمْ تَظْلِمْ مِنْهُ شَيْئًا Not a thing was missing, not one plant didn't produce. He was getting 100% out of his farm. وَفَجَّرْنَا خِلَالَهُمَا نَهَرًا And the only thing missing now in a farm, you know if you travel in the Midwest especially, you'll see farms that are being irrigated, right? So you have these machines that spray the water. But what if, what in old times, you had to have animals that go and deliver the water every place, Allah says, that between the two we had caused the spring to come out. So he's got two gardens, two huge properties, and between them there's a water supply by Allah And he takes credit for it himself. And that's the thing I want to highlight and go back a little bit. Allah Azza wa says, وَحَفَفْنَا لَهُمَا بِلَهُمَا He says, وَفَجَّرْنَا خِلَى لَهُمَا نَهَرًا Every time Allah mentions His assets, He says, We fortified it with palm trees. Allah did. We made a spring flow in between. He didn't say the farmer owned it. Allah says, I gave it to him, I gave it to him, I gave it to him. So through, even before we get to the lessons of the ayat, we're already being taught lessons. This rich man is not rich because he's very intelligent, he made some very smart investment decisions. He's rich because Allah made him this way. Allah took credit throughout the ayat even. Even as you're reading these ayat, you don't think, wow, this guy must have been a really good businessman. You're thinking, wow, Allah really blessed him. <laughs> Allah doesn't take credit away from himself as even describing his assets. Now what happens one day? There had وَكَانَ لَهُ ثَمَرٍ And the one who used to own a lot of fruit, in other words, the guy that had a lot of wealth. The wealthy one. He's one day in a conversation with his buddy next door. The guy next door, you know, he lives in one of those old homes that you think should be demolished and then it should be rebuilt nicely. He lives in one of those properties, you know, and he's next door. So one day they're just, you know, ta talking to each other and it just comes up. He says to his companion, the guy he sees all the time, and in the middle of just kind of conversing with him, he's just talking to him, they're just chit-chatting, and in the middle of the conversation, he slipped in something. You know, I am more than you when it comes to money. And I do have a lot more than you when it comes to manpower, children, sons, helpers, employees. I got a lot more than you. Now you have to understand, this is not how you would imagine the guy, the rich guy, came out of his house, went over to his neighbor, knocked on his door, the neighbor opened his door, he said, by the way, I wanted to tell you, I'm richer than you. Assalamu alaikum. That's not how it happened. That's not what's being told to us. Well, who are you? Haviru, who is important because they're talking about other things. And he kind of slips it in. He slips it in. He lets him feel like he's poor and he, the other guy's rich. He doesn't say it directly, he, he inserts it in the conversation. So you know, for example, you have you know, some of you younger guys, you go to college. And alhamdulillah, you come from wealthy families. So you drive your BMW to school. And you have a friend who also goes to the same college, but he's, you know, he's barely making tuition. He's living in an apartment with like eight other guys because he can't afford it. And he takes the bus there or walks to school. And you're like, yeah, man, just got the Beamer. It's a good deal. It's just 25,000. It's a good deal though. How'd you get to school? You know, you kind of just slip it in, like poke him a little bit. You're not, saying, you're not saying directly, I am wealthier than you are, sir. Assalamu alaikum. You're not doing that. But you are making him feel insignificant. 
Some of you elders do this. Yeah, our daughter's wedding, mashallah, we only held it at the Crown Plaza. It was only $50 a plate. You know, mashallah. It was very good. It could have been better though, because we got a good deal because they were asking for $80. What about your, your daughter's nikahs at the masjid, right? right? Just kind of kind of slip it in. Help people. Let people know that you've got more than them. You don't say it directly. You, see, you, you, know, you, you attack people and make them feel less by what Allah has given you. And this, this attitude, this attitude, even you're not saying it directly, you're not saying anything. And if you talk to her, why do you talk like that? I was like, I didn't say anything. I was just talking about my daughter's wedding. I was just talking about this car, it's a really good deal I got. I didn't say anything harmful. You can defend yourself very easily, even if this farmer was stopped and told, why do you talk like that? He goes, oh, I was just talking, man. I was just, I'm just saying. It's no big deal. Well, what are you and I have more authority when it comes to employees. Yeah, just, you know, this year I'm downsizing. I only got like 15 employees this year. How many of you? You work by yourself, right? Yeah. Good luck with that. And just uh, this kind of condescending behavior. And there's more before we go on. You know, in Muslim community, in all societies, in all societies, one of the great sources of corruption is wealthy people imposing their lifestyle as a standard on poorer people. So poorer people feel like they are living a miserable life until they live the life of rich people. So you'll find in struggling communities across the world, and the United States is no exception, in the Muslims the easiest example to give is the wedding. Easiest example of all. Your family has a modest income, maybe you make $50,000 a year, maybe you make $70,000 a year, whatever your situation is. You have rent to pay, you have the house to pay for, you have education bills to pay for. But you know what, your cousin, who's very wealthy family, their wedding was $200,000, their wedding was $80,000. The mahar was this much, the party was this much, the catering, they had 10 parties before they had the nikah. And now it's your turn and you're like, we can't do a simple wedding, we have to keep up. What are they going to say? What is your uncle going to say? What are people going to say? What is this one going to say? What is that one going to say? And as a result, what you do is you put yourself in extreme difficulty. So that you make it look to people for those two days, you make it look to people like you're pretty wealthy too. Even if you have to pay off riba loans for the next 10 years for that one day of wedding, and start that new wedding couple off in financial catastrophe, what a way to start a married life. Even if you have to do that, just to make sure people see us as keeping up with everybody else. This pressure can destroy families. It can destroy families. It creates hatred in society too. You know, the, the place where I originate from in Pakistan, you'll have sometimes people that are very wealthy, living right next to people that are extremely, extremely poor. And when they'll have weddings in their family, they'll, you know, they'll set up tents in the entire block, and they'll invite thousands of people to the wedding. And they'll have hundreds of employees, hundreds upon hundreds of employees just cooking food, right? And these, each one of these cooks, each one of these cooks, one of these cooks has four daughters, and he can't get one of them married. And he looks at this party for one wedding and he says, man, in this kind of money we could have gotten our entire village married, you know? And he looks at that wealthy person, he's working for him, but he hates his guts. Because there's a hatred being developed by people who show off their wealth in this lavish way, especially in the face of the poor. Who is what we're being taught. These are not just ayat we pass by like a cool story you teach at Sunday school. These are teachings for how to live as a community. How not to be lavish. How to not to impose our wealth on others. To put standards on others. We've convinced ourselves until you buy a house and until it looks like this and this and this. Until it's something that people come to and they park in the driveway and they go, wow, that's nice. Until they do that, we have failed. Our children have failed. They still live in an apartment? Astaghfirullah al -Azim. How can they live in an apartment? You know, why haven't they bought a house yet? How can you still have that car? Why haven't you bought another car yet? You know? And we put those, those standards on them. We're just like this farmer sometimes. What does the other farmer say? The other farmer's response. When the, and by the way, he talks insultingly to this farmer and we don't even hear the response from this farmer. The other guy, the neighbor, he didn't say anything. You know what that suggests? Sometimes you're so embarrassed you don't say anything. He's put in a bad situation, so he doesn't say anything. Now the rich guy goes back into his house. He was just visiting his neighbor. Now he goes back to his mansion, his great farm. وَدَخَلَ جَنَّتَهُ وَهُوَ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ And he enters his garden and he's wronging himself. 
By the way, what's beautiful is in the previous ayah, he had wronged his neighbor. He was mean to his neighbor, wasn't he? He wronged himself. He was only harming himself by these kinds of words. He was blinding himself from reality. He forgot that the one who made him rich in the beginning of these ayat, as Allah described, wasn't him, it was Allah. Allah had made him rich. It wasn't him. And he goes inside and he says this in something, a very interesting confusion that many Muslims suffer from. And it's not just Muslims, many Christians suffer from it. But we do, it's surprising that Muslims suffer from it and we're people of Qur'an. We're people of the teachings of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, مَا أَظُنُّ أَن تَبِيدَ هَذِهِ أَبَدًا I don't think this stuff is ever going away. I think my business plan is pretty solid. I've made some very smart investments. I've put the security system in place. The employees are just where they need to be. The financial projections I've made for the next 10 years. This isn't going anywhere. I've got a stable situation. I don't think this is going anywhere. And then he adds, this is from what he can see, he doesn't think it's going anywhere. But then he adds, وَمَا أَظُنُّ السَّاعَةَ قَائِمًا And yeah, day of judgment, I don't know. I don't even know it's gonna, really going to happen. Allah probably just said those things to scare us. He doesn't really mean it. You know how parents sometimes tell their children, if you eat dirt, you're gonna, I'm going to kill you. Well, he's not really going to kill us. I'm going to get a little, you know, a spanking here and there, but it's okay. It's not going to be that bad. You know what happens when you get used to a life of luxury? You don't want to even think about the akhirah, because the akhirah is a difficult thing to think about. When homes are taken away, and the earth is flattened, and everybody's standing on equal footing, and you're being interrogated, and you have nothing of this dunya left, well you get so attached to dunya, it's hard to let go. It's so hard to let go that this guy doesn't even want to think about the akhirah. And somebody even brings up hellfire, paradise, judgment day. Somebody even brings these things up and goes, no bro, don't talk to me about that stuff. I don't want to hear it. Can you take, can you just talk about that later? We all believe that, okay, thank you. So even if by his tongue he believes practically, he doesn't even want to enter that thought into his heart. He doesn't want to do it. And he has an interesting rationale that shaitan has taught him. A way of thinking that shaitan has taught him. This rationalization, very interesting. He says, Even if I was taken back to my master, even if I did die, if Allah has given me so much here, that must mean that Allah loves me. Because Allah obviously loves me more than my neighbor. My neighbor is, look at him. He's in debt. He, does, he barely has a farm. He has no helpers. He's getting old. But look at me, Allah has given me this, this, this. Allah has hooked me up so much here. That must mean Allah likes me so much that when I go, if, I, if He gave me this much in dunya, he'll, He's got way better for me in the akhirah. He's going to give me just... Jannah on top of Jannah and Akhirah, this is what I'm getting in dunya. In other words, he assumes that the life he enjoys here must be some kind of a glimpse for the life he's going to enjoy in the next life. By the way, this is interesting. A modern Protestant idea. There's a modern Christian idea too. In many churches you're taught, go get a promotion, get a better job, take out a second mortgage, you know, work, work, work and get the nice car because Jesus wants you to get it. That's a sign that the Lord loves you. The more you have, the more you acquire. In our deen, we don't condemn the acquisition of wealth. We don't look down upon those who are wealthy. And we don't look down upon those who are poor. Because wealth and poverty are both tests from Allah. Neither of them are good or evil. There's no, so wealthy people are evil or poor people are righteous. There's no such thing. Some of the greatest Sahaba are extremely wealthy. And some of the greatest Sahaba are extremely poor. We don't have that standard. We don't judge it by that. But when you start thinking how Allah thinks of you is based on what you enjoy in this life, then you are in the depths of confusion. I will definitely find better than this over there. That's my that's that's his thought process. Now finally, when his religious ideas are getting confused, at this point his neighbor feels like he should say something. See, this neighbor, his righteousness is shown in that when he was insulted, he didn't say anything. But when the guy started having wrong ideas about Allah, then he felt compelled to speak. And he answered him. And he says, قَالَ لَهُ صَاحِبُ هُوَ هُوَ يُحَابِرُ And he didn't even just give him a lecture. He, you know, maybe invited him a second time. Now they're just chit-chatting and talking. 
And in the middle of a conversation, he slips some advice in. So just like he had slipped insults in, his neighbor is now slipping in advice in the middle of conversation. And he says, أَكَفَرْتَ بِالَّذِي خَلَقَكَ مِنْ تُرَابِ ثُمَّ مِنْ نُطْحَ ثُمَّ سَوَّاكَ رَجُلًا Are you completely in denial of the one who made you from dirt? Then he made you into a droplet, a filthy droplet. Then he turned you into a man. In other words, you were nothing. You talk about your farm being everything. You yourself were nothing. You were dirt. Allah put you in this position Himself. Are you forgetting who put you here? Well, how can that happen to you? لَكِنَّهُ اللَّهُ رَبِّي No, that, that's Allah, my master. Now, it's beautiful, right? So when he's giving nasiha, he's giving advice, he doesn't say, لَكِنَّهُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكْ He's your master. No, he said, Rabbi. I'm not even talking about you, Ufi, Nafsi, Awalam. I'm advising myself. I'm just saying he's my master. Wala ushriku bi Rabbi ahada. And I've decided never to do shirk with Allah. He doesn't say to him, La tushrik bi Rabbi. Don't do shirk. He doesn't talk to him that way. He still talks about himself, and that's part of his humility. You know, he's just showing by example, I, I can't do shirk. I can't say that whatever I have is because of. This all my akhirah is guaranteed. I think that's like shirk. I would never do shirk. I'm not saying you're doing it, but I just can't do it. <laughs> he points it to himself. <laughs> and then he says, <laughs> And then he says, <laughs> That shows that what was so wrong if you just entered your garden as you walked into your amazing property, if you just looked around and said, Allah, whatever Allah will. And we usually say MashaAllah without even realizing what we're saying. We have no, usually we see a nice one, MashaAllah. Seven series. MashaAllah. You know, new Acura NSX. MashaAllah, nice house. That's how we say MashaAllah. But MashaAllah also means something else. Allah decided that He will give me this risk. Allah decided my neighbor will have less dunya. He will have less, less risk in this world. That's all according to Allah's plan. I know that Allah makes His plans. That's not up to me, that's up to Allah Azza wa Jal. I can't take credit for what's going on here. This is by the will of Allah. This is what Allah, whatever Allah wants. And when you say whatever Allah wants, you recognize that nothing here is permanent if Allah doesn't want it to be. You cannot make guarantees, لَن تَبِيدَ هَذِهِ abada. This will never go away, because it's not up to you, it's about, um, up to the will of Allah. Why couldn't you talk like that? Why couldn't you humble yourself? There's no force, there's no, there's no power at all except in Allah's, in Allah's hands, in the possession of Allah. If in fact you did see that I am less, and I am, I'm not saying I'm not, I am less than you, I agree. I have less, less manpower than me, I don't have sons like you do. I don't have any support. I don't deny that, but I'm saying if you saw that, you should have said that's what Allah wills. Some people he gives sons, some people he doesn't give sons. Some people he gives wealth, other people he doesn't give wealth. How many people in our audience today, subhanAllah, they're unemployed, they're looking for work. And they have good resumes, they have experience, they have good qualifications, and they're applying, and they're maybe barely even getting a call for an interview, and they can't find a job. And then there are people who are not even half the qualifications you have. But Allah decided they're going to find a job, and they're going to get paid three times the salary you're looking for. <coughs> It's up to Allah Azza wa We make the effort, but the power belongs in Allah's hands. He can't forget that. That's the very essence of materialism. Materialism means we put our trust in things. We put our trust in things like our resume, or the money in the bank, the property, each other. Our real trust has to be with Allah Azza wa Our iman is not just something we say with our tongue, it's a, it's a state of mind. It's a way to think. That's what we're being taught here in these ayat. And so as I reach my conclusion, I want to share with you, he gave him advice and said, you better watch it. It might be just to teach you a lesson, فَعَسَى رَبِّي أَنْ يُؤْتِيَنِي خَيْرًا مِنْ جَنَّتِكَ It's very possible for my master to give you a garden like yours. Allah could make me wealthy too. أَوْ يُرْسِلَ عَلَيْهَا عُسْبَانًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَتُصْبِحَ سَعِيدًا زَلَقَا Or it could be that Allah sends some kind of timely destruction from the sky, and He will completely eliminate your garden. There will be nothing left. أو يصبح ماؤها غورا فلن تستطيع له طلبا Or the, the water of it is going to sink in. Remember he had a, a, a river going in between? It could be the river could sink in and you won't even be able to dig it and find it. You won't even be able to ask for it. You won't know where it went. That could happen too. Watch out. Don't mess with Allah. Be grateful for what you have. 
And what happens in the very next ayah? When you know, when Allah hears the word of a believer, especially the dua of the mazloom, it's not even dua, it's just asa, it might happen. But Allah Azza wa hears it, and He says, wa uhita bi thamarihi. And His entire, His farm was surrounded. Then He's surrounded by the punishment of Allah. His, his fruit was surrounded. You know? فَأَصْبَحَ يُقَلِّبُ كَثَّيْهِ عَلَى مَا أَنْفَقَ فِيهَا He was just left standing there, turning his hands like this, looking at his investment. Oh my God, what, what's happened here? He's just standing outside, going crazy. He doesn't even know what to do. His hands are just... You ever seen people, people that are really stressed out? They don't know what to do with their hands? You know? They're having hands like this, they're putting them behind their back. يُقَلِّبُ كَثَّيْهِ عَلَى مَا أَنْفَقَ فِيهَا And then the, the most incredible thing, وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَى عُرُوشِهَا the Urush in the Arabic language are the... Remember I told you those the delicate sticks you put in the ground to keep the plants up? Allah says that the garden was turned over on its sticks. In other words, those palm trees that are supposed to protect those plants, Allah made those palm trees fall on the very things that they're supposed to protect. His security system was His destruction system. That's what Allah's plan was. And all of this seems like a terrible thing that happened, right? But at the, at the ending of the story is beautiful. Because in this dunya, if you make tawbah, it's a good thing. If you have to lose all your wealth, but you gain Allah, that's a good gain. <laughs> that's a good gain, you didn't lose. At the end of it all, he says, Ya laytani lam ushrik bi rabbi ahada. Oh, if only I hadn't done shirk. If only I hadn't associated with Allah, my confidence in this material wealth. If only I hadn't become a materialist. In other words, he regrets his shirk. In other words, he comes back to the right way. And that is a gift from Allah. What, are we, what am I trying to say to you? The Muslim world today, and all of us, Allah has given us many blessings, and He has taken many things from us too. The Muslims enjoyed in their history as a whole, times of glory. Times of glory, and they've been, it seems like we've been robbed of them. Maybe so we can just turn around and say, Ya laytani, la mushrik bi rabbi ahada. Maybe we can make tawbah and go back to Allah Azza wa too. And before Allah Azza wa teaches you a lesson in a hard way, we had better read these warnings and know these are not just stories, this is a formula with which Allah Azza wa teaches lessons, so we better make our tawbah and return back to Allah before it's too late. May Allah Azza wa make us people that don't put their reliance in material goods. May Allah Azza wa make us people that don't become arrogant and show off their wealth and make other people feel bad on account of what they own. May Allah Azza wa make us a people of giving, of sadaqah, of infaq, of brotherhood, of you know, of ta'leef, of making hearts come together, not hearts being pulled apart. May Allah Azza wa help us to become those that keep family ties together and not allow them to separate at any cost. May Allah Azza wa make us of those who look at the past as the past and join hands with their brothers and their sisters in this deen and understand that their bond of la ilaha illallah is stronger than any quarrel, any disagreement, any problem they've had in the past. This kalima, these words are stronger than any of our disagreements. May Allah Azza wa make us one ummah once again. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه اجمعين Folks move up as much as you can there are a lot of people standing in the back إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا